Our next panel attempts to explore the world we live in. Featuring Kezom Masale, Head of Digital Programs, Chief Digital Office, United Nations Development Program. Ashok Malik, Partner and Chair, India, the Asia Group. Colin Reed, Group Global Intelligence Manager, Salesforce. Evan Feigenbaum, Vice President for Studies, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. This discussion will be moderated by Dr. Samir Saran, President, Observer Research Foundation. And I would request everyone to please be seated as our next panel goes on to the stage. Panel AV, please. Good evening and uh, welcome back, or rather, uh, I'm glad you all stayed back uh, from the previous discussion, which was fascinating. And we're going to try and take some of that forward in this particular conversation as well, titled The World We Live In, The Road to G20. And uh, like we heard, uh, national sovereignty, national security, competitive advantage in business are all factors that are going to shape how we partner, how we contest and sometimes how we compete in the digital arena. And, and to discuss these aspects, we have a fantastic panel who's already been introduced. Uh, Kezum Masali from UNDP, Ashok Malik from the Asia Group, uh, Colin Reed from Salesforce, and of course, Ivan Fagenbaum from Carnegie. And uh, maybe let me start with Ivan because you're the furthest away from me and, and I can ask you uh, something, uh, something controversial um, with a degree of safety. Um, what are the consequences of what we saw play out uh, in this conflict that's uh, unfolding in Europe? We saw big American tech platforms um, cancel Russia. Uh, what is the signal that is sent to the world outside when American tech, which is supposed to be a global transnational endeavor helping the world connect with each other, takes the decision to cancel one particular country? How are others supposed to read this? Uh, is trust in American tech uh, harmed by what happened? Or do you believe that this is perhaps something that is the direction uh, America and its companies have decided to take? Thanks, well, Samir, before I do anything else, um, I, I want to acknowledge Carnegie India and you and say what a pleasure it is to be back in Delhi. Again, I was joking with Ashok, it's like time stopped for three years and now it's begun again. So it's nice to see everybody, it's like a reunion. Um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna broaden that question because I think that uh, geopolitics in a lot of ways is at the center of the way the United States is increasingly thinking about technology, particularly from Washington where I sit. Um, and I should caveat that at the beginning by saying, look, I'm, I'm American, so I have a very American-centric view and Americans were famously strategic narcissists. We think everything's about us. Um, but for most of the world, it's not necessarily about the geopolitics that Americans think flows through all of this. It's still fundamentally about how technology intersects with their agendas, growth, employment, opportunity, sustainability, upskilling, all of those things. But from an American perspective, geopolitics to a degree that I don't think was the case 10 or 15 years ago, really does flow through a lot of technology-related issues. And I, I think the three changes that I've seen, I would characterize them as securitization, mm -hmm. techno-nationalism, and extraterritorialization. And the first one has a lot to do with the change in the nature of technology. Mm -hmm. If you think about the couple of decades after the Second World War, so much commercial innovation to my mind at least, depended a lot on things that were essentially war babies. Things like British radar or American computing or American nuclear science. They drove a lot of weapons-related innovation. But after the advent of semiconductors and commercial microelectronics, that relationship really flipped. And commercial innovation was driving a lot of weapons-related innovation. But if you project out 
10, 15, 20 years at a lot of emerging and foundational technology. Life sciences, biotech, new synthetic and composite materials, quantum, artificial intelligence enabled applications. All of these things are intrinsically dual or multiple use. And so things that have a remarkable ability to transform the future of work or industry or service delivery, they're also intrinsically related to defense. And for that reason, the American default position, especially from a Washington perspective, is essentially to securitize all of those things. Okay? So that brings me to the second dynamic, what I call techno-nationalism. If you securitize everything and you don't view the flow of capital, technology, people, data, knowledge, strictly as a commercial good or even as a public good, but as something that's intrinsically related to national security. In other words, if economics and security collapse together and the former is refracted through the prism of the latter, then inevitably, who makes things, what they're used for, where they're made, why they're used, those things intrinsically become national security questions. So American policy, in my view, has become a lot more techno-national. And that is bleeding from government into companies because companies are getting caught at the pointy end of the spear of American regulatory policy. And in the last two administrations, one Republican, one Democrat, Trump and Biden, American strategic, the American strategic class, the political class, the regulatory class have basically discovered that they can use all of these regulatory and administrative instruments, the Commerce Department entity list, um, various other export controls to essentially try to shape markets and control the flow of these things. And that's a wholesale change. And then that brings me to the last dynamic, which is what I would call extraterritorialization. And a lot of third countries, notwithstanding their agendas, <coughs> think they can not get caught betwixt and between. And this one has to do not just with geopolitics as defined in the United States, but to be blunt about it, the US-China confrontation. Both the United States and China are taking essentially regulatory instruments that they've had available to them domestically, and they're extraterritorializing the application of those in ways that I'm here to warn you will catch a lot of third countries in the middle. And the United States is out to essentially extract voluntary compliance, particularly on the flow of technology and knowledge to China, and China's doing some of the same thing. But if it doesn't get it, my prediction to you is that the United States is going to basically try to do that involuntarily by extraterritorializing the application. And if I rewind the clock 15 years, Samir, none of that was really the way people thought about technology in companies, so, in so markets, Ivan, or think, in government. I think you've laid out a very vast landscape. That is, I think, the perfect segue for the rest of the panel. And let me start with you, Ashok. You were uh, in government for a bit. And um, let me ask you now. Ivan is quite uh, in many ways unequivocal in, in stating that American policy is going to weaponize tech, is going to influence its political objectives in distant lands. Now, seeing what happened in Europe, how does that, how should that worry us sitting in India? Uh, thank you, Samir. I uh, must begin by thanking Carnegie and the MEA, my, my home for, for three years. Uh, for inviting me to this conference. Uh, I was here last year in another capacity. I'm glad to be back. Uh, thanks, Samir, and thanks, Ivan, for starting this conversation. Uh, while Ivan was speaking, uh, I was thinking of my days in MEA when the Ukraine war broke out and you had the, the, the first wave of sanctions. I think I'd like to break this down to, to two very basic and simple human instincts, trust and choice. Uh, in the technology sphere, a country like India, or most countries in the world, would want to work with trusted partners, trusted technologies, would, as the, the new Indian uh, legislation, uh, draft legislation puts it, would want to uh, have mutual uh, data storage agreements with countries that they trust, geographies they trust, would like uh, to adhere to standards drawn up in collaboration with countries they trust. We all know where, which direction that's headed towards. A country like India would want to work with fellow democracies rather than non-democracies. But alongside that, there's also the instinct of fair competition and choice. This is, this is important if I'm using an app store and getting access to some apps but not others. It's important when I make my, my payments on my mobile phone or whatever, I need choice. I can't be plugged into just one monopolistic system. It's also important for a country or a broader financial system. So 
For instance, if my digital supply chains, my, my hardware supply chains are running through China and only China, and that's essentially got me uh, ransomed, I need choice, I need a backup. If Swift, which till earlier this year we thought was a global system, a global public good system, suddenly shuts its, its, its access to some countries but not some others, uh, it does get people wondering that, you know, today it's a deliberate choice. Tomorrow it could be an accident or a, or a, or a cyber attack. Do we need a backup? Do we need uh, the technology equivalent of key man insurance? Do we need a key technology insurance? Uh, if Twitter is uh, my principal mode of political communication or, or public communication, and one day, for some reason, Twitter shuts me out or, or its server stops working, do I need a backup? People have started thinking of that. Let me give you a, a very real example. Uh, in February, the, the, the war in Ukraine began. Russia invaded Ukraine. And uh, Russian uh, credit cards, debit cards, and uh, Russian banks, swift access to Russian banks all collapsed in a day. At that point, uh, the single, uh, one of the single largest national groups of tourists in Sri Lanka were Russians. They were staying in five-star hotels in Russia, in Sri Lanka, in, in Colombo, and elsewhere, uh, and obviously paying those hotels and paying let, allowing those hotels to pay their staff and salaries and all of that. Suddenly, their card stopped working. And there was massive collateral damage. I'm not suggesting America or whoever's managing SWIFT wanted to do that, but it happened. It led to uh, a crisis, a, a grave political crisis on the streets of Colombo. And, and it led to an overthrow of a government in, in Sri Lanka. I'm not saying that was the only reason it happened, but it was, it contributed, it was the, the final straw. So, uh, Many countries across the world are going to look at that sort of a situation and say, we need a backup. I have no problem with Russia. I have no problem with America. I have no pro problem with what America is doing to Russia, but I need a backup. No, but, but so then the question is that uh, exertion of power through technology, is that going to be something that the world is going to play along with, either US or China? Because I think both of them are beginning to do exactly that. Or are you going to see a third way, something that we heard about earlier in the day as well, uh, where, where the backup is not necessarily a backup anymore, but the trunk. It's the main way for many economies to proceed ahead. But you're already seeing that with, with India's own digital initiatives. I mean, you know, UPI is not swift, but UPI offers some sort of an alternative pathway, perhaps, uh, for, for money transfers. So uh, I, I think countries will look for avenues and pathways that don't allow them to become completely uh, in hock to one system or the other. Uh, yes, they, in a country like India, there will always be greater uh, congruence and greater agreement with, with, broadly speaking, Western democracies. But even there, we will look for backup plans. Okay. Uh, let me turn to you, Colin. Um, how does what Ivan said problematize your work? Uh, you know, and, and does San Francisco agree with DC uh, about uh, the geopolitical nature of Salesforce? Yeah, well, thank you so much for the question, and uh, it's a real honor to be here at the Global Technology Summit. Um, to your point, I think it's really instructive that the, the term geopolitics, right, is in the, the headline for this summit. Um, I think for about three decades there, geopolitics was out of fashion, right? It was the end of history. It was something that companies like Salesforce, global multinationals, uh, didn't have to think much about. You know, we could really spin the globe and put our finger down and as an American tech company do business there in much the same way that we did business in the United States, in San Francisco. Um, and as we see with the war, as we saw with COVID, um, and as we're seeing increasingly with the, the US-China uh, competition as well, um, that's no longer the case anymore. It was a luxury to be able to ignore geopolitics as a company, right, for so long. Um, but we're not able to do that anymore. So that's really changing how we're thinking about geopolitics. Um, it's something that we have to be involved in now. Um, and as a result, I think we're starting to realize that you know these, these big multinational tech actors we are actors in our own right in this system. You know, governments have a lot to say about how we do our business, um, but we can also be a little bit more proactive about thinking what we engage with, where we engage, what's the risk tolerance that we want to accept for some of these geopolitical issues that, let's be frank, we can see coming. We can see the China, US, Taiwan issue coming. We could see to some extent that there would be an issue with Russia, Ukraine, right? 
Um, so the way that Salesforce is really approaching this is, you know, my background is in security. Um, historically, that title that is over there on the screen meant that really we were focused on keeping our people safe, our sites safe, and our events safe. Um, but we've expanded that de definition of what is security for Salesforce in the past year or so. Um, and now we're thinking about this very strategically. We're trying to bring together people from all the business units across the company that have some impact on geo front, that geopolitics will impact their, their, their part of the business. So, so there's supply chain implications, there are human resources implications, um, there are government affairs implications. And all these people are doing their job every day and doing it really well. But nobody's thinking strategically, let's all get together and say, two years from now, what's gonna be the big geopolitical issue that's really gonna cause Salesforce a big headache? Let's think about that now, let's plan for that now, and let's decide what's our risk tolerance? How do we wanna engage with that geopolitical issue in the future? That's something that I'm seeing increasingly across the industry. It's not just at Salesforce. Tech companies really are starting to see themselves as you know, caught in the middle on a lot of these issues. And it's something that I think increasingly you're gonna see become a, an important part of, of, of what investors look for in a business. It's almost like an add-on to ESG, right? Mm -hmm. How is your company thinking about geopolitical risk, and what are they doing to plan for it? Because shareholders will start to hold you accountable, and if we're entering a, a sort of, you know, end of the end of history moment, um, that's going to determine winners and losers, frankly, in the market. Who can plan for these things and who can avoid risk? So, Colin, let me, let me just ask you another question related to that. Um, and and uh, maybe not just the Salesforce response, but uh, you speak to your counterparts in other companies. I'm sure you're talking about this all the time. How do you make yourself trustworthy? Or has the element of trust been eroded in recent years because of this geopolitical, uh, uh, the weaponization of, of tech? Do you find it more difficult to do business in distant lands? Or do you think it's remained largely unaffected? I definitely think it's more difficult to do business and to, to be seen as trustworthy. And I think a big part of that is it, it's, it's unintentional, but by having a short-term tactical mindset, you put yourself in a lot of positions where you're quickly reversing yourself on policy decisions, and that's the thing that makes you look untrustworthy. There is a you know, major a satellite internet provider company that at the beginning of the Ukraine war decided to take one stance on the war very publicly, um, and then six months into the war decided to change their stance on the war for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. and they got absolutely lambasted in the media as a result, right, for, for betraying the Ukrainian side in that war. Now, that is a business decision that was probably made for business reasons, but that company looks untrustworthy now, right? Um, so I think a big part of, of us planning strategically for where we want to mitigate our risk and where we want to engage, um, I think that's uh, something that's going to help us with this trustworthiness issue. And, and the idea of trustworthiness, the idea of brand protection, is embedded in this decision making, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It is a very sort of soft, squishy side of the risk calculus, because we do have a risk that's a physical risk, but I think it's just as important, and I think it's something we have to consider. So, Kezo, I saved you for the last, because I, in many ways, these three gentlemen have laid out the challenge someone like you faces in when you try to evangelize the idea of technology for good, of data for development, of digital commons, of digital public goods. In this backdrop, where from uh, weaponization of tech to the geopolitical considerations of investments to uh, seeking alternate pathways and backup uh, routes, as Ashok mentioned, how is a global digital commons going to emerge? How has this problematized your work, which actually believes in bringing communities together, creating digital public infrastructure, financial inclusion using technologies, money transfers, uh, public flows that are uh, serving global good? How has your job changed? Thanks, Samir, um, and a great question. Um, I think the short answer is that as the United Nations, we are certainly deeply reflecting on the role that geopolitics is playing within the UN system, particularly when we do development work in the countries. So UNDP is the lead development agency of the United Nations. We are across 172 member states. Um, and it's forcing us to also think about the creation of the United Nations at the end of the World War II when, you know, 51 member states got together and agreed to advance human rights, uh, uh, shared goals, prosperity. Um, 
and we fast forward to today with, you know, the UN um, has about 192 um, member states and territories. Um, and the context has changed remarkably. Um, the, and the change in the context really is propelled by digital, by technologies. Um, and it's forcing us to think about the broader role of the United Nations in sort of advancing digital commons um, in also thinking about the governance structures around digital commons that builds trust, that builds credibility, that avoids the kind of instances that Ashok spoke about uh, when the Ukraine war broke out. Um, so these are some, I think, important reflections. Um, but if I speak from, um, um, you know, the point of view of uh, sort of India's role and as we prepare for the G20 and, you know, where does geopolitics versus collective action really sit? As the UN, we really look to India for some leadership in this new space and context that's emerging because other member states are looking to India for that leadership. Um, because to create the new sort of architectures, the cooperation frameworks, the governance models will require India to deeply reflect on what has worked here. And this is where even the Secretary General during his recent trip to India spoke about, you know, this year, this coming year being a real opportunity as both, um, you know, an advocate for the sustainable development goals, but also a, a model in terms of having tried and tested and still trying and testing to in, in make sure that all of India is included, all of India feels safe, secure, and um, interfaces with trustworthy digitized services. Um, now, if I think about it from the context of uh, you know, our day in and day out work across our 172 program countries, the question never is should I build a digital public infrastructure or should I have an open source solution versus a non-open source solution. The problem really is I have you know, 200 different disparate digital platforms and they're not speaking to each other mm -hmm. and you know, uh, competition among ministries, uh, competing stakeholder priorities. Um, and really for the UN, we are also asking how can we better coordinate our multilateral system so that we create more um, uh, platforms for collective action um, so that we can um, you know, help um, uh, achieve some of the sustainable development goals through a shared common rails across countries, whether it's affecting climate resilience, whether it's government to people payments, and so on and so forth. And Samir, when I you know, talk about the India leadership, you know, just as a reminder, uh, during the framing of the high-level panel on digital cooperation, it was because of India that the language around digital public goods entered the global vocabulary. Uh, it was because of India's tremendous leadership that uh, with uh, Norway, with the government of Sierra Leone, India created uh, or, you know, catalyze the creation of the Digital Public Goods Alliance. So we have some really um, amazing bright spots where we can kind of, you know, delineate between geopolitics and mm -hmm. collective mm -hmm. action. And these are the kind of spaces I think we have a real opportunity to look for during this uh, coming year. So I'm going to come to uh, the G20 aspect of this particular panel in a bit. But before that, let me ask you another question. When you're sitting in one of the program countries, say in Asia or Africa, uh, do they think about U.S. tech, China tech, making choices based on, uh, you know, something that Ivan and others are suggesting? What is the response from your program countries? What drives their choices? I mean, of course, um, you know, the implications of technology from various sources is certainly discussed as part of um, uh, how leaders or cabinet ministers or even how they interface with the development partners in countries happen. But I think um, they are much more focused on how do we make sure, you know... The solutions. How do we make sure our women have access to financial mm -hmm. services? How do we make sure our youth are engaged and empowered? How, how do we make sure that our startups are supported with the right policies, et cetera? And this is where I think India with its, you know, many of you will know this terminology, digital the last mile connection of the last mile infrastructure with the community interlocutors. Uh, many of our colleagues from, you know, APTI and, and other think tanks have done tremendous uh, research into this 
uh, area where we need to consider um, global digital commons within the local contexts where we leverage, not replace, and strengthen um, uh, those, you know, civil societies, those community interlocutors um, to create the right behavioral nudges, to support with onboarding. And these are, I think, the lessons that really, I think, um, inspire many countries in which we work. Um, these are the lessons around which there is very great interest in the India model. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so Kedum, I'm going to take your question to Ivan now, and I'm going to try to turn it around, Ivan. Um, trade data shows that the US is not necessarily holding its own against China in the recent decades. China has a favorable relationship with many more countries than the US does, and it's 100 plus countries, right? Is, it, is the US going to be able to hold its own when it comes to the, to the control or rather the proliferation of technology solutions, or is China take the way ahead? And I'm, Ashok, I'm going to come to, to, to you on the India way, and I'm Colin, I'm going to ask you to sum up what the three have said. But, but Ivan, uh, tech competition, Asia, Africa, US, and China. No, I mean, I, I, I think the answer to that question depends a lot on how the United States chooses to approach it. And the first problem is conceptual. If I can use a mathematical metaphor, you know, if you're most countries around the world, the, the mathematical operations that matter are addition and multiplication. You want as many connections from as many partners and as many points on the compass as you possibly can have. And that's additive. So, you know, you see a Chinese solution for one thing, you see an American solution for another thing, you see a non-American nor Chinese solution for other things. But if you refract everything through the geopolitical frame that I was talking about before, then the mathematical operations you tend to focus on are subtraction and division. And the United States, to be blunt about it, has not had a lot of traction around the world, particularly in the global south. Um, by trying to essentially project its agenda onto third countries. And it goes back to what I said before. It's just for most countries, the agendas that matter are closer to home. It's growth, opportunity, employment, upskilling, connectivity, and so on. So the very direct answer to your very direct question is I think ultimately the answer to the question about competition for the United States depends in part on the frame that the US uses but also on what the US brings to the table. And the reality is that what the United States does is not what China necessarily does. And so, you know, there's, there's this expression, the US shouldn't try to out-China China. It should play to uniquely American strengths. So what are those strengths? Best-in-class financial services firms. Best-in-class, in many cases, STEM education. Um, world beating innovations, world beating technology solutions, lots of interesting technology platform companies. So the question is first the offering, second is the price. It's not just about price. In a lot of countries I find what, what wins it for China is not in fact price, it's things like upskilling that China has rolled in. I don't know if you've experienced this in a lot of places, but my favorite example of this is, is uh, a, a region like Central Asia. Mm -hmm. This is a region where everything that China was doing for a long time, it was extractive industries, oil, gas, mining, and then it was big infrastructure like high-speed rail, belt and road, trains moving from one place to another. And then the Chinese discovered that if you're Kazakh or you're Kyrgyz or you're Tajik or you're Uzbek, standing beside the railroad tracks waving at the trains as they go by while collecting transit fees is not really what aids people, markets, economies, governments, growth. And so China's adjusted its offering, and increasingly it's about upskilling, and it's about a lot mm -hmm. of the packages that come with that. So that's meant to change in the investment. So the question I have is, how does the United States adjust to that? But I know what won't work is telling third countries that the United States has only interested them, interested them mainly as proxies in an American competition with China, because it's not in their interest to be viewed that way. And the US has been spectacularly unsuccessful around the world with that message. So I think it's an open question. But my hope is that the United States will adjust. But I don't think the, the track record has been especially successful to date. Yeah. Ashok, between US and China, as Kezum mentioned, there is a, a sliver of space available to a third way. And of course, Kezum is betting on India. But how do you see this possibility fructify in the days ahead? This is the G20 year. Do we have it in us as um, 
uh, as a country that thinks about the world stage as some uh, as, as a provider of services provider of global commons or digital commons in this case do you think we have it now uh, in our minds that we can play this role so very good question let me just place it in some context uh, i think people do think about us tech and china tech broadly uh, people do think whether the preloaded app on their phone is giving a certain perhaps american company a commercial advantage or whether the preloaded app on their phone is giving the Chinese state a surveillance advantage. I mean, there is a difference. Uh, but uh, I'm not willing to, to forego the surveillance overhang, uh, overhang uh, and, and make somebody very rich, obscenely rich, without fair competition. That is the, the key. And that is where India and the US can actually work together. If the, if, uh, and, Quite frankly, that is the only way, because many of the solutions we have experimented with and used, even in 5G, where frankly, uh, it initially was a binary choice, the Huawei or, you know, the, or our way, the American way, in a sense, as you once put it. Uh, but it became obscenely expensive. So you had to come up with something else, with another solution. Uh, I think that sort of realization has to be there in, in the West, in, in California, and it has to see India, India's solutions, India's uh, digital skills and advantages and, and workforce as a force multiplier. And uh, it's only that partnership that can offer the world a viable alternative, a viable democratic alternative to the Chinese model. And that's what, frankly, is, could be the biggest takeaway from, from G20. And yet you see the two countries quibbling about everything on trade and tech. You know, uh, I guess Washington has to understand that the India-US digital partnership is beyond, you know, what war Twitter is fighting with which regulator in India. So. Okay, so we'll wait for that realization. Till that, Colin, uh, is it time for Salesforce to think of itself as a, as a company that can benefit from something that Ashok just painted? Actually, a partnership opportunity um, experiment in the largest laboratory in the world, and uh, those products become an offering for other markets around. Is that something that is now going into design stages in big corporations? Not only Salesforce, but you can give me a broader sweep. Yeah, I think I think the the thing that's running through my mind right now, hearing these two gentlemen, is um, that you know the, the the choice you have really between U.S. tech companies and China tech companies is that with China tech companies, you're always going to get. Beijing's priorities first, right? So if it's Huawei, if it's CTE, you know that the first thing that those tech companies are gonna be able to do is, is really the Beijing priority. With the US tech companies, you'll get the US restrictions, you know, you'll get the, you'll get the sanctions when they, when they no, occur. No, but you also get Elon but, Musk's priorities, right? But you also get, right, a, a greater sort of a, a, a diversity of voices, right? So the, the Microsoft solution that you might get offered is going to be vastly different to the Salesforce solution you might get offered. And that's an individual choice that those companies are able to make largely for themselves. Now, there are constraints that are coming in in the new era of competition, right? But I think that that's an interesting element of nuance that we need to consider here is that, you know, Western tech companies, there is quite a degree of freedom that comes in with how they choose to do business and where they choose to do business. Now, we're seeing that in India, right? Salesforce is really experiencing a great degree of growth in India because it is offering an interesting new third way, right? It is a huge growth potential market, not only as, as a market for us, but also as a place where we actually build and create, right? Um, so that is a huge new opportunity for us, and I think that's part of the, the nuance. And are you, you seeing see. parts of your India experience now being offered to other markets? Absolutely, I, and I think I think... Move, pivoting right to this to this slim third way is is an important benefit that Western tech companies can can start to make those decisions on their own to not abdicate these decisions to Washington to Beijing to really proactively decide where do we want to engage in the world and how do we want those engagements to look um, that's something we can do that Huawei can't do that Yandex can't do so that is a huge benefit for us so I'm going to bring you guys into this conversation those who have questions can walk to the mic and pose questions to the panelists I would like to ask a final question to all of you quick a rapid question all of you uh, could we could respond um, in a couple of minutes each. Um, the, the dangers and um, uh, the dangers to open societies. Uh, uh, you know, there is also, it's not only about the US weaponizing tech, others are doing it as well, and some are doing it quite successfully within the US as well, Iman. So, uh, 2024, the first time in our digital age, uh, 
we are going to have the US, India, perhaps even the European Parliament, if I remember correctly, and some others go for elections for the first time in the digital age. And we are going to have uh, those who don't really necessarily believe in democracy going to enjoy the open public spheres that we have created for them to play with. Are we competent and capable to prevent the gaming of our uh, open public spheres uh, and to defend uh, 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 our, the, the legitimacy of our governments going ahead? Ivan, over to you. Well, I guess it depends whether you mean that in a technical sense or in the sense of social cohesion and political cohesion. Because there's a lot, I mean, you know, there are lots of Americans in the audience. I mean, there's a lot going on in our country now in terms of social cohesion and political cohesion to be concerned about. And, um, you know, ultimately social cohesion and belief in political institutions depends on a shared set of facts, a shared set of norms, a shared set of understandings. And those are weaknesses that are in, that, 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 I don't want to use the word weaknesses. Those are fissures in our society that are easily exploitable by those who wish our institutions and our democracies harm. And that includes, as your question was implying, authoritarian powers and powers that, and other actors that engage in disinformation and misinformation. So I think we all worry about it, but ultimately the, the best defense against it is the kind of social cohesion and, and political cohesion that we used to enjoy, but that I think in the American context, a lot of us increasingly worry about. Ashok? You know, I'm, uh frankly, cautiously pessimistic, I'd say, because uh, 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 we are in a crazy information and, or disinformation age, uh, which can only uh, end when you simply stop believing everything you read on the internet, okay? <laughs> which is not going to happen. Because uh, I, I am very concerned that the 2024 election will see serious disinformation and, and cyber ops uh, by by countries adversary to, to democracies, particularly to India. Um, in fact, uh, that trend has been emergent for some time, and uh, one can see it happening. And frankly, if you you know, 20 years ago, if you'd been sitting in this room, uh, the number one national security nightmare we would have been discussing would have been a nuclear strike on Delhi or something. Today, we all we don't worry about that as much as a cyber attack on a banking system on our banking systems, and uh, that remains a a, a, a constant and unremitting risk and danger. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, the whole notion of security has changed and changed forever. And I don't think we're going to get uh, uh, any degree of satisfaction coming out of it. Uh, I'm going to come to both of you. Um, let me just pick up some questions because I can see people lined up. So why don't we pick up all three of them first, if you will permit me. Let's gather them. And then we'll go around and, and respond. Go ahead, sir. Uh, hello. And please introduce yourself and pose the question. Yeah. Myself, Jai Goel, and I am from the Indian School of Public Policy. Um, my question is to Mr. Malik. Uh, how do you see the role of uh, COD within G20 in terms of shaping India's role in the global technological market uh, to counter China's dominance? Because we are focusing on US, uh, China, and India, but we are forgetting Japan and Australia. So how do you see this? Thank you. Thank um, you. Mr. Pai? Uh, my question is to Kazem and the rest of the panel. In 1948, the United Nations gave us a universal declaration of human rights, and that protected all of us and created human rights globally. And that was the industrial revolution era. Now we're in the digital revolution. Mm. Do you think we require a universal mm. declaration mm. of digital rights mm. founded by the UN, one, mm. to protect 8 billion people from the digital monopolies like an Apple, like Google, or a Facebook, who could shut you off and you don't exist. Two, from countries like the United States and the OECD who can just turn off the system because they can impose their rule on, let us say, Google and say, just shut them off and we are left without anything. And three, to make sure that there is a grievance redressal mechanism in case something happens within countries and globally. Do mm -hmm. we need a global compact now and, to and not to replace in addition to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So does Geopolitics 4.0 require a fresh declaration of uh, citizen rights in that particular age? Um, one last question, and then we'll come to you. Uh, thank you. I'm Rijul Sarsev. I'm a GTS Youth Ambassador from mm -hmm. IIIT Bangalore. Uh, so there are two parts to my question. So uh, one is, building on the last discussion that we had, uh, it's obvious that 
technology is not without ethics of its own, right? And nowadays, I don't think anybody would say technology is ethics neutral. So technology does favor certain ethical stances. For example, there are certain technologies which favor uh, democracies, and etc. So uh, I, my question is, do you think that India will lead the G20 in a way which will further technologies which in are more embra are embracing democracy? And uh, I'm going to make a slightly controversial statement here. Do you think in order to be more inclusive of the rest of the world, we need to be a little more exclusive of China? Okay. So, Kezum, I think, let's start with you and Colin, and then we'll come to Ivan and Ashok. So, let's start with you, Kezum. Well, thank you so much for that brilliant question. Um, and actually, just two months ago, I was having the same conversation within my office about whether we need to do something as fundamental as update or change or have an equivalent declaration in this very, very different context that we live in, which is forcing new partnerships, new coalitions, more competitive spaces, um, and many unknowns. So I, I think we are on the same wavelength. We will certainly be pushing internally within the UN and with our member states to make a case for it. Um, and Samir, to answer your question, I feel very optimistic. Mm -hmm. I feel optimistic um, for a number of reasons, and I see uh, my colleague Asan smiling away. Uh, he's one of the reasons for optimism, because there is uh, an entire university in Rwanda, in Kigali, that's focused on bringing that <clears throat> adjacent private uh, digital capacity to the mm -hmm. public sector and Asan is creating that network across Africa. I'm hopeful because we have a tech envoy at the UN who is from India and uh, is you know, going to um, be brilliant um, uh, and you know, uh, work together with our member states and all the uh, stakeholders. Um, I'm optimistic because of what I've heard in this room, Samir, today, the conversations that I've had in the, have had in the last year um, you know, uh, just shows how each of us are going way beyond what our mandate or terms of reference says uh, to, you know, really ask these hard questions, but also try to find and suggest some solutions and place it in the right corridors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Ashok. So I'll answer the, the, the two questions which were addressed broadly to me. One was on Quad and one was on, on the non-China. Uh, no, I want you to answer also, Mr. Mohandas Pai. Is it time for a is it time for a universal declaration of digital rights? Uh, you know, you've accused me of being part of the trade union. I'm going to come to you for that. <laughs> but tell me, is it time to have a declaration of human rights? You can have a universal digital declaration rights. of digital rights, but uh, you know that would be just one more declaration passed by the UN General Assembly. Uh, how that, do you enforce that it? That no one adheres to. Yes. How do you how do you enforce it in 200 countries? So, mm. so. Uh, Yes, a very good idea. Uh, what do we do next? So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, coming to, to Quad and the non-China, I think, look, there are many responses to the emerging geopolitics of tech. Now, China is, of course, the, the rise of China is a challenge in, in many areas, including tech. But I, I don't think the response has to identify itself as we are the non-China, because that, you know, that, that's, that's not really helpful. Uh, I think we're, we're Quad's conversations on tech are really helping is in two directions, in two areas. One, uh, standard setting and norm setting and starting the conversation in that uh, domain, uh, whether it relates to artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, uh, even the internet and, 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 and uh, hate speech on the internet, for instance. Uh, quad countries have discussed all of these, either together or in conjunction with, with, with similar uh, minded countries. The second is looking at uh, uh, supply chain resilience in the digital sphere, which entails, uh, in, in the technology sphere, which, in, which looks at critical technologies, uh, critical metals, uh, and of course, a whole range of supply chains which are currently passing through only one geography. Uh, it, that happens to be China. Um, do you want to, Colin, do you want to come in? Yeah, sure. I, I'd like to tie all this back to that last 
point that we made on the panel about, you know, are democracies uniquely vulnerable to these challenges? Um, I think the thing we know about democracies is that they are at their most vulnerable to disinformation, fissures in society, when there are obviously constituent voices that are not participating in the democratic process, whether that's because they're atrophied and they feel it's not worth it, or whether it's because they're actively being excluded. Um, and I think that's relevant to then this discussion of should there be a universal declaration of digital rights? Should we be soliciting more voices, whether they're Indian voices, whether they're voices from tech companies, right, about how we structure our society digitally to protect the things that are important to us about our democracies, right? Um, in the lead up to the Ukraine invasion, um, you saw the US government come out and say, oh, we think the Russians are gonna invade Ukraine, and the Russians came out and said, no, we're not. Now, if those are the only two voices in the room, it's really up to you to choose who you believe. You have ample reasons not to trust both of those voices. But what you started to see was a number of independent voices, tech companies, non-government actors, coming out and saying, you know, we think there's something to this, we think there is gonna be a conflict here, and that really increased the public perceptions and faith the in, in that narrative, in the United States in particular. Um, the, the vast majority of the, the public that you know, has good reasons not to, dis to, to, to distrust the United States government came to accept that that was a, a legitimate uh, thing that was gonna happen. So I think I'd just draw that through line that the more voices we have in the room on this, I think the stronger our democracies are. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's fluff. I think that's like a real tangible objective that companies can work towards, that people can work towards, and that you know, governments can work toward as well. Uh, and perhaps also a response to the point uh, about monopolies. Uh, and let me add a layer to that. Uh, what happens to um, collective um, nego bargain, collective bargaining uh, that the earlier trade unions or workers could indulge in? Now with gig economy and, and, and contractual workers and distant uh, workforces, uh, and this is something that pertains to your work as well, how do you see collective bargaining emerge? that can protect rights and, and, and basic standards of expe expectations for people around the world. So monopolies and, 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 and workers, how are they going to navigate this new world? Yeah, I think that's a really, that's a really huge challenge, right? Um, and again, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go back to underlining my point, right, that, that you need to be able to hear the voices somehow, and if it's not gonna happen through collective bargaining and it's not gonna happen through unions, then it needs to happen through some other outlet, or you will have people that will withdraw from systems, whether they be you know, monopolies or rideshare apps or whatever it is. Um, people will withdraw if they're not heard. Um, so there needs to be some solution. Now, I don't know whether it comes from the government. I don't know whether it comes from some other st sort of non-government structure that's not a union. Um, but I do know that as a tech company, it's in your interest to be proactive about soliciting those conversations. Because if you don't enable it, it will happen without you. Ivan, over to you. A quad, maybe quad, and how could that, how can the grouping such as the quad and like-minded countries Well, you have a lot packed into that. I mean, first is the assumption that the like-minded are in fact like-minded. And, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I think that's, that's kind of the core challenge is that um, I think in a lot of ways the world is heading for fragmentation on a lot of the things that we've been discussing. And part of the reason for that is not just because of what's going on between the US and China. Part of that is not just because of democratic approaches versus authoritarian approaches. But on a lot of the issues that are implicated, by the discussion today, the democracies are not on the same page. I mean, I just think about data localization, cross-border data access and transfer, the open data. Are the, are the United States and India on the same page on these things? Absolutely not. Data localization in India, we know what the law enforcement authority thinks and why it wants things domestically. That's not to American liking. So, so the question is gonna be, what are we trying to forge consensus on? And then how do we lock that in through institutions? Because to go to your question, Mohan, about a declaration, you can have, I, I think declarations like international institutions ultimately succeed or founder based on a market test, which is they either lock in a pre-existing consensus among those who make the declaration or are party to the institutions or they don't. And if you don't have that pre-existing consensus, then declarations become empty, as Ashok said. Um, and institutions ultimately fail, as they have many, many times. So then to go to your point about the Quad, here's four resilient, consolidated, ostensibly like-minded democracies. And so the question then becomes, how do we, as I've put it in other contexts, allow function to drive form rather than the other way around? 
And I think in the Quad, as in other institutions, the ultimate test is can they organize themselves as first movers around some set of meaningful functions, um, lock in a consensus among themselves, and then find a way to make that meaningful to fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth parties uh, in ways that actually uh, you know, shape outcomes. And if they don't, if it's all about form rather than function, they get together, they hold ministerials, they make declarations, then ultimately the quad will meet the same fate as a lot of institutions. So the good news is I think, if you think about how the quad started, it was all about function, right? It was a response to a tsunami in the mm -hmm. Indian Ocean. The group put itself out of business when the mission had been achieved. It then became all about form and it was groping for purpose. But I think increasingly these four governments are trying to make it about function again. And so the question for our conversation is what are the technology functions and what are the things in the digital and data space, for example, that these four can lead on as first movers and become, I guess the, the way I put it in a piece I wrote with somebody last year is the firm core of an elastic architecture in this region and beyond. And that ultimately comes down to whether they can form a functional consensus or not. And I think the jury is out on that in some of the most important areas. A quick follow up. So uh, I, I like the example of Quad coming together to respond to the tsunami uh, challenge at that particular point of time. Uh, as we enter this G20 presidency year, and I think that's a good question to end on, do you think um, providing a global public good could be a good starting point? And perhaps a India digital offering that offers that digital public good to the emerging world could be something the US may support. Oh, absolutely. And the U.S. should support it because, I mean, we heard about this in some of the panels today. If you think about something like financial inclusion, which came up on at least two, maybe three panels, this thing that India has done where you take Aadhaar and then you take people who are outside the organized financial system and people who are unbanked and basically make them banked, that is a model that India has developed that can be exported and scaled across the global south in places where there are lots of unbanked people. And by the way, particularly women who are unbanked and outside the organized financial system. And I think frankly, if I may be blunt about it, the Indian offering is far more compelling than what the United States and the transatlantic partners are offering. And that's important not just in the G20, but also for the way, again, since I'm American, the way I fear some Americans tend to talk about India, for example. We often talk, as I was joking with somebody this morning, about India as a place that is in need of reform. But the reality is if you treat it as the subject of the story rather than as an object, India actually has pioneered reforms in a lot of areas that are both relevant to broad swaths of the world and can be exported. And so, again, to the point that you just made, the United States should get behind that because the offerings are compelling. But even if you frame it in the geopolitical context that we began with, it is if the US wants to compete with China, why does the US have to have the monopoly on the ideas, the models, the approaches? It doesn't. And in fact, some of what the US has is not as compelling as what some of its allies and partners have. That's the kind of like-mindedness, I think. 30 seconds really each compelling. to Ashok, Kezum, and Colin. You know, simply put, to take off from something Ivan just said, technology flows used to be unidirectional, north to south. Today, it's a Brownian motion. It goes from everywhere to everywhere. And that, that makes the, geopolit the geopolitical technology very confusing, but also so mesmerizingly energetic. Kezum, you were shaking your head when Ivan was speaking, yeah. Just to say I agree with Ivan's last statement, my final words. <laughs> Colin, final word. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree as well. I think that the, the, the beauty of the, the tech wave that we're in now is that it was founded on the open marketplace of ideas, right? And we've gone to a place where the marketplace for ideas has been dominated and has been closed, and I think it's time, high time, that we, we reopen that marketplace of ideas. Open the marketplace. That's the final word from this panel. Let me turn it back to the organizers, and please join me in thanking the panelists for their wonderful remarks. <laughs>